My name is Joel Sorge, um, and I'm the creative director here. And uh, I came here because it was the first time I'd met a senior leader who truly had an apostolic calling, gifting, and authority, not just the power and position, but the authority to, uh, to say what he was saying, but also had this vision that he's had from the very beginning when it was just a cornfield and the steel building down there that we're finally going to tear down next year. Um, it, it, when it was nothing, he had this vision for innovation and creativity. And it is so hard to protect a vision when things are good, let alone when it's out of reach, you know? And so you imagine all those years, a guy like Lee Cummings, who's a visionary out the wazoo, and just like tempered by the circumstances. And so I looked at that and I said, man, this guy's been in a foxhole and taking live fire. I think someone who's willing to hang on to the vision for creativity and for what this could be in the kingdom and what this could do to our city. I'm willing to get in the foxhole. I just need to know that he actually, this isn't a, a charity where it's like, hey, listen, come here, be creative, we'll let you, we'll pay you, but then we're going to control you and have that transaction. I didn't want the transactional ministry position again. Um, and, and not that I'm not trying to demonize anyone that I had been in mission with, but that's how creativity has been approached and related to the body of Christ, by and large, for my lifetime that I can observe from my extremely limited vantage point, is we'll let you do this but we'll stop it here because we can't guarantee what all this gray area might lead to. Now, I believe in order, authority, coming under authority. Jesus did it. He did it. Artists should do it. Um, But I didn't know there was a place I could thrive. I thought it was possible, just didn't think it was plausible. So I am here because I thought, hey, this is plausible. I'm going to take a risk. And honey, we're moving again across the country. And if he turns out to be the Antichrist, we're not moving again, so this really better work out. I don't want to pack up our house thrice in a year. So it's been a little over two years. It's it's become our tribe and our home almost immediately. By osmosis, we 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 were just thriving here, and um, and and you know our hope is that the culture creatively that we're trying to build here blesses you guys, and also hopefully can illuminate. Maybe some vision, um, maybe, not, maybe not too far, but maybe a few steps ahead on the path from where you're at, what you're envisioning for yourself, for your ministry, for your life. So um, I did go fat longer on that than I had intended, but I am going to jump right in. I'll just skip over a few of the bad parts in my notes <coughs> to make room for that. Hopefully there are none, but you know, if there are, you heard it here first. You can't hold it against me. Um, so uh, visual, visual storytelling, and I said it's kind of a, how do you describe media and art and communication and all the, I mean, it's so everywhere. It's in everything. It's not as simple to say a movie or a video or a website or this. Everything is kind of all one reality now. So when I say visual storytelling, obviously I'm kind of trying to narrow in on how we communicate and connect with content through all these screens that we all have in our pockets and they're everywhere. And so the, 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 the highest potential ever to make uh, impact and connect with people, but what I've realized is, regardless of the technological availability and proliferation of small things that allow us to get stuff to a lot of places, no matter what area in life we're talking about, potential is rarely tapped. And I think there's a big gap and a lot of tension between potential and actualization. And so I am not preaching from a point of actualization. I am on a journey towards trying to figure out what that looks like, just like the rest of you. But I do think I've lived in the tension long enough that hopefully I can kind of give some keys that have helped unlock a path forward to go, hey, how do we do this? Like, how do we not just always be a church that's a decade behind culture and ill-equipped and irrelevant and insignificant? And I'm not trying to talk about relevance in the 90s way that we talked about relevance. I'm talking about true relevance, true kingdom impact through our stories and through our media, through our content, no matter what it looks like. It might be a podcast for you. It might be a TV series. It might be a play. Whatever it is, we were created to tell stories and connect with people. And stories have the potential to change lives. It, that, that's a stupid sentence. One thing has, abs- Jesus chose this thing other than carpentry. He's like, I like woodworking, so I'll do that for a while, but then I'll transition to the real deal. Storytelling. It, he changed the paradigm of the world through stories. And so we live in an age, though, which that's very popular to say, like, oh, I'm a storyteller. I'm like, no, you're not. You're a barista. The beans came from Ecuador. We get it. But you're not, like, telling stories is, oh, everyone's doing it. Because we all, not everyone can do it. But not everyone does do it well. And I believe we have an opportunity to go to a higher level of excellence and, uh, and down a path that may not be as obvious 
as, uh, as you would traditionally think. So I want to talk about what I think um, is that path forward for us. And it's in progress here, hopefully. And next year, if you come back and it didn't work, we'll have a new plan in place and you can get it then. Um, there's one thing that every audience demands. And it is very simple and it is very difficult to achieve. But every audience says, no matter who they are, make me care. You have to make them care. If you can't make them care, how can you make them disciples? You have to make them care. Um, there's only one fear I have in any of my work. It is the ultimate fear. Because I know I'm going to hate my work the minute it's done. You know, my dad's like, hey, I'm going to show the old video. You know, it's the first video I ever made. Never picked up a camera before. It was, I didn't know what I was doing. It, it's amazing it looks that good. It looks terrible to me now. And I'm just like painful. I, oh, I hate anything I've completed. We showed the opening thing this morning. And I'm like, by the end of spending so many hours in front of that, I hate it already. Oh, it's never good enough. So it's, it's not about um, things being good or bad that makes me scared. What makes me scared is indifference. I do not want to create anything that doesn't make you love or hate me. Now, maybe that's a little extreme, but you kind of have to be aiming for a very specific thing to hit anything at all. If we're like, I hope some people like it, then I guarantee you no one will, and you'll hit no, you'll hit no target. So for me, I want to make them care, and I want to go, hey, I want this to be something you have to reckon. You either have to, and I'm not, not, not to be a provocateur who's like, oh, this is really going to piss people off. I can't wait. You know, I'm not trying to make people angry. It's not a disingenuous trick or tactic, but I genuinely want, if this is worth making, then I want it to make a difference. If this is worth making to me, then I'm going to find, I'm going to do everything I can. The way I can show love and generosity to an audience is to leave it all in the field and make them care. And so that's why indifference is my ultimate fear is if I, if I, if I can't make you reject or accept this, then I did something wrong. And so that is kind of the, the plumb line that I'm approaching this with. Can I make you care? You know, and I think that's something, no matter what you're doing, whether it's writing songs, preaching a sermon, or making a short film, that's, that's your tension. Like, you have to do that to succeed. So, what do, how do we do it? How do we maximize our potential to reach people digitally with our message? Because we're all here. I, I'm assuming if you're in this room, you have a sense of purpose and calling and a reach. That you're like, I want to get this message to the people who need it. Right? Is there anyone who doesn't fit that? <laughs> okay, we all want to get the message out. Okay, good. So I think that there's five things... Um, Five, I'm calling them kind of core elements, and they're not the only ones. I'm sure there's like 80 other things that I just haven't discovered yet, therefore they don't exist to me. But I will learn. I'm a nonstop learner. We're all learning. But to my mind, over the course of the years for me, there's five things that I've come to um, see as the core elements of maximizing potential and reaching people with with, uh, stories. Number one is identity. Two is message. Three, mastery. Four, mission. And five is direction. Identity, message, mastery, mission, and direction. And I want you to take note that I did not say money, connections, opportunity, recognition, or pedigree. Resources, uh, citing the absence of resources as the reason you can't get to where you want to go is the vernacular of incompetence and laziness. I do not think, because I know, And I'm going to prove it to you by the end that you do not have to have any money and you do not have to have anything but time and a willingness to work harder than anyone (laughs) to to achieve this. Because that's the that's the price of doing business is doing it really bad for a long time of being focused on what's ahead. And so money, opportunity, connections, none of it matters. And if it did, then the summer blockbusters would be the best movies every year. But they're not. The little indie film that spent five grand and begged and borrowed and stole from all their friends is the one that makes it, right? They're like, oh my gosh, newcomer filmmaker who had no money and no friends and no life and no available time and da-da-da-da. But they were desperate and focused. And so these things have nothing to do with resources and nothing to do with your current circumstances. So that's my hope is that we can look at all these and go, I am a candidate for putting these things into work and actually seeing success and reaching the people that I feel called to reach. Identity. Um, there's a quote by Jeff Bezos, slightly famous, slightly successful human. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Started a little company called Amazon. Um, and he says, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. That is a powerful statement because I don't think, we're not, I don't think it's uh, limited to just literally a brand as in a business. I think we all have um, a, repu- you know, a synonym for that might be reputation, um, who, the who of who you are. Um, but what are people saying about us when we're in the room? So 
Your identity is the most important thing about you. You cannot separate your identity from your work. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible to separate who you are from what you do. Because the substance of who you are, 100%, will reveal itself. So what Pastor Lee talked about this morning, that pressing. Because in any creative endeavor, if you're doing it right, you will encounter resistance, difficulty, and something too big for you to succeed at. It will happen if you're doing it right. If you're not, ever, if, if you're not living on the verge of being terrified to the point of heart attack every time you create something, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> um, so who you are is really, really important. And uh, something that I recall hearing over the years, I don't know if you've heard it in the circles you grew up in, but um, it's really popular to say, oh, you know, we're Christians. We should be making the best stuff. And uh, why doesn't the church do better? And da, 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 da. Yet you look around and it's a bunch of trying to mimic something that already exists. But guess what already exists? The stuff that exists is the substance and product of the people who made the thing. How can you mimic that and have it even come close? You're not that person. You have to make what only you can make. So your focus should not be to make something different. Your focus should be to become someone different. You have to become something greater if you want to make something greater. And greatness is a direction. You, you don't ever stop. I'm not talking about judging it the way we judge you know, typical shreds of success in our society. They're successful at business. They're successful at church planning. They're, I'm talking about you. And you got to stare in that mirror and you got to know. You can't lie to yourself and you can't lie to God. Who am I? Who am I really? And so that is a really, really important. It is the starting point is who you are. It cannot be separated from what you do. The next is your message. Um, All you need in order to proclaim something is knowledge. Uh, But to demonstrate something, you need authority. You need authority. Power and position can be given, but authority cannot be be received from anyone. Only only God can give you authority. Um, A lot of people miss out on the message they could have because of the message they can have right now. And if you want a message that matters, that makes people care... Then you got to start with identity, and you got to go, God, like, who, who are you calling me to be? What story are you writing with your life to steal, to steal a line from my dad, from others? He's got an awesome book called In Between the Lines. You should check it out. All his books are up there. All are up there, right? Yeah. Um, and to kind of summarize the book, it says, God doesn't write short, boring stories. If you want God to write a story with your life and create a legacy, it's going to be long. It's going to be full of tension and drama. All the stuff we like in good movies is available to you. <laughs> And uh, the message you're proclaiming is not accompanied, if the, if the message you're proclaiming is not accompanied by the evidence of authority, you run the risk of achieving the same potential as a fortune cookie. Because fortune cookies sound clever and they feel good immediately, but you forget it immediately and it doesn't matter and it ends up in the garbage. So how do you do that? Well, God, God will take care of what your life message is supposed to be and you have to dial that in with him. That's, that's between you and him. Um, but I would encourage you, if, as you're looking to apply that, whether it's as a writer or a filmmaker or whatever, um, you have to, to use, the, I, I use the writing terminology a lot because there's lots of quotes I like that come from writers. And so you can apply this to you, but you have to write what you know. And so stop trying to have a message that you think, man, I really like that dude's message. Or I like that woman's message. Why? I wish I had that message. I'm going to replicate that. Don't do that. No one's going to believe you. And no one's going to care. And if they don't believe you, they're not going to care about your message. So I think the thing you need to be focused on with your message is not, okay, what's going to be the thing that gets people to follow us on social media? What's going to be the thing that gets our numbers up? Because I know your pastors want both of those things. <laughs> I know, I know, we can all diss it, the popularity, you know, it seems like, hey, we got to stop looking at social media, but then like low key on Monday, so how's social media going? You know? um, but uh, I don't despise social media, by the way. I hate it sometimes, but I don't despise it. But the point is, your goal has to be to write what you know, not what you think people want to hear. You have to create what you know, not what you think people want to hear. I'm going to move on to the next piece. Um, Mastery. Um, Identity and message make up the foundation of storytelling. But, uh, But the form and efficacy of your storytelling is determined in large part by the command of your craft. You can have all the good intentions in the world, and you can have a beautiful story in your, in your life that you want to share. You can have the message that people want to hear. But if you're not competent and in command of your craft, no one will see it. And that, that I am willing to die on that one. 
I promise you, when's the last time you saw a really bad movie and then talked about it a few years later? Like, it's just, it's never going to happen. And this is something the church has actually done really poorly is, and especially with those of us in occupational ministry, we, we prioritize um, and value certain things, and we should. Obviously, there's spirit, there is a hierarchy to priority, right? Like, not everything is, you know, totally subjective. There are things that absolutely matter to every church that should matter at every church, um, but then it goes, okay, so now we got we to, let's say you got your priorities in order. Let's say you're like, okay, we're here. You know, for us, it is it's very simple. We exist to make dis- radiant disciples of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the mission statement. That's the vision. Everything else better come into alignment with that or it doesn't. So whatever it is for you at your church, it may be something similar. It may be a little different. God uses different cultures, different moves uh, of, in the kingdom to emphasize different things. And that's beautiful. So there's di- diversity there. However, what I see across the board, regardless of the message the Lord has given you to steward and to share, where we, where we kind of nosedive into um, failure <laughs> is we take the message seriously. We take the value seriously. We, talk, we love talking and discussing, talking about discussing the vision, but we never make the decision to prioritize it. And um, to pursue mastery in your craft, you need, obviously, you need inspiration. You need motivation. You need purpose. But you need discipline. And you need to lock yourself and learn the lock yourself in your room and learn the tools. Um, there's never been a great song from someone who didn't know how to play their instrument. I mean, not really. You got to at least be able to put some chords together. You may be a beautiful lyricist, but if you don't know the piano or the guitar, like, what are you going to do? So you have to you have to know your craft. Um, and for me, what that looked like this may not look like this for you, but when I left when I left ministry, I had a job for a year, and this was um, in 2000. I left in 2011, so 2011, 2012, I had a job working for a friend, and the economy was terrible, and so he had to close down part of his business, and I happened to be employed by that part of the business, and I was like, "Sweet Lord, the hits keep coming," um, and uh, and so I found myself jobless. And I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's depressing. But we, <laughs> we, we got through some really tough challenges. Uh, and at the end of this, at the end of this kind of, I would say it was a fork in the road. I can go this way or I can go this way. Um, I realized, okay, if I really want to do this, because when you're in ministry for 10 years from 18 to 28, and then you've only got a couple of years of life experience outside of that, there's not a lot of people lining up to hire you. You're like, oh, you were in ministry? you're a good person next you know it's it's there's not like especially when the economy is terrible everyone's shutting their business down so i was like all right lord i guess i'm freelancing and so uh kind of by way of working on some projects with my dad i discovered oh these things that i thought i would lose forever when i lost ministry i could do this on my computer and so anyone any malcolm gladwell fans in here if you haven't read his books, you should. Phenomenal. In one of his books, he has this thing that he kind of, you may have heard of elsewhere, but it's called the 10,000-hour rule. In order to become a master of something, most people who master something have put 10,000 hours in. And so, um, and so usually it takes about a decade. And so I'm sitting there going, all right, if I've got to provide for a family of six, and I need to be good in order to be hired and paid to do that, how fast can I get my 10,000 hours in? And so... I'm not recommending this. This is not healthy. But I would put in probably 80 hours a week um, begging and borrowing and stealing gigs as best I could. But on top of that, going above and beyond on everything, because I was like, I can't do what I want to do, and I can't have the reach I want to have, and I can't attain the future I think I want to see unfold before me if I'm not willing to work harder than because there's going to be someone who's cheaper. There's going to be someone who's more talented. There's going to be someone who's more connected. I, there... I have no control over the variables that determine whether I succeed as an artist or fail. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but most artists are poor and they don't make it. And I was like, what is the difference? Because it can't just be talent and it can't just be luck, even though talent and luck are very helpful. And for me, I was like, I'm going to work harder. I can't guarantee the results anywhere. But with what I have, which was a laptop much crappier than this one and a really bad camera and a lot of ideas... But no idea how to do them. And I said, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put myself through school. How fast can I get myself through school? And that's the kind of desperation it takes. You've got to kind of tap in. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to skip over this next section. The one thing I want to highlight in it is motivation. And another quote from a writer, uh, and, and I'm still talking about the pursuit of mastery here, but one of the things I want to highlight is, is motivation. And motive is really important. Um, there's a secret that real writers know that wannabe writers don't. 
It's not writing that's hard. It's sitting down to write. (laughs) What is your motivation? You have to have a really good reason why you are doing what you are doing. Because if you don't have a really good reason why, you are not going to put in the time. You're just not going to. And, And if you think there's another way, like, hey... You know, oh, I'm not good at this, this, and this, but I know people who are, or hopefully people who might be, might enter my life. I can rely on them for that. It sounds romantic, and you call it collaboration, but you're waiting. What are you waiting for? Pursue mastery. If God brings people to partner with you along in life, hallelujah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah's back there. Sarah does all of our video announcements and stuff. She's brilliant. If I got on that screen, everyone would be like, can we do less video (laughs) announcements, please? Or none. Print is not dead. Bring it back. We're going to communicate everything. (laughs) You know, thank God she is in our life and she collaborates with us. She brings strength, right? You have people like that around you. God brings those people. You can't control that. But when no one is around and it's just you and it's just your idea, it's just your vision, it'll be nothing but kind of idealistic imagination until you're willing to do what no one else is. Do what others won't now so that you can do what others can't later. It's really important advice. That's how you pursue mastery. And it's not, you don't arrive. You never arrive. We never discovered who the masters were until like 100 years after they're dead. Like, you never arrive. And you have to be okay with that tension if you want to see true effect through your work is I'm never going to arrive and it's going to cost me a lot of sweat and tears and the computer's going to crash. I'm going to lose it all. I remember this one video I did for him. Um, It's called Poison, the Praise and Rejection of Man. It's on his YouTube channel. And uh, I had never done any sort of keyframing, animating of anything. I was a designer and an artist, so I was like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. Anyone who is a filmmaker or works in video here, I'm not even going to tell you how I accomplished it. But all I know is about 250 hours in, I had to start over. And I don't know that it was worth the 500 hours I put in. I hope it is. He thinks it is. It's free for him. Uh, (laughs) It was worth it. It was a part of my life. But most people get annoyed at the resistance. And what you got to realize is the pathway towards mastery, the pathway to success, doesn't get blocked with obstacles. It's paved with them. It's paved with obstacles. The the obstacle is the way. In fact, there's like eight books I could recommend that are all about this. That resistance is your pathway forward. And so... That's what pursuing mastery looks like. And uh, that's the one thing that I do not claim to be a master. I hope people will say it about me one day. But I do tell you that I pursue it every single day. And it's something that I think is really, really important. To end that section with one quote that has really stuck with me from Craig Rochelle. Um, You can choose the pain of discipline or you can choose the pain of regret. I say choose the pain of discipline and work towards being equipped to do the thing that is being shaped by who you are and the message God has given you. The next next piece, mission. Um, I, you know, I don't. I don't think I need to talk a whole lot about this to this crew. We're all here because we have a sense of direction and mission and calling on our lives. Um, or you're just hanging out, and that's cool too. Maybe you can get some mission at the end of this session. <laughs> um, but why are you here? Like, why are you breathing? Like, and why does your life matter? And what will you regret not doing? And what do you want people to say about you, about you when you're gone? We're talk- this is legacy. Mission and legacy are synonyms to me. If I'm not on mission, like, I, and I know that maybe I'm, I'm just wired this way. I'm sure there's those of you in this room who are, and I'm sure there are those of you who aren't. But I can't think of anything, well, I'm not going to exaggerate. It is really difficult for me to imagine wanting the simplicity of the American dream. I want money just like the rest of you. I want to go on vacation just like the rest of you. I want success. I want these things. But to retire as soon as I can so that I can have more stuff to impress people I don't really like, like that to me seems like hell. And so I am always, always like heart sick with this reach towards legacy. Like what will people say about me? Not because I care about... um, somehow eclipsing Jesus, I, my, my mission is clear. I'm here to make disciples. I'm here to reach people who are hopeless with hope. I'm here to share the gospel. I'm here to use my craft however I can to reach people. Um, and I can't quantify that, which means it's real. Because we get really discouraged when we can't quantify something. If I can't measure it exactly all the time, then it must not be working. And there's some stuff with creativity and art and music and all these things that you have to be comfortable with the ambiguity and the tension. But you still 
The only way you can be is if you really know why you're here. You really know. And I think regardless of whether or not, you may just be sitting in here because you didn't feel like going to another one or the one you wanted to go to is full. Sorry. Probably elevation. There's probably some people here who didn't have a seat at elevation and they're like, oh, fine. I'll go to this one. Um, but the, uh, you need a sense of mission. If you don't have one now, you need to get it because it will tether you. It will, it will be a preservative in choppy waters. It really, really will be. It'll, it'll preserve you. It'll keep your head above water. It'll keep you focused. You really do need it if you want any of this stuff to truly bear f- lasting fruit in your life. And um, I'd encourage you to look at the, the, life of, the life of Joseph. I've been in Joseph a lot over the last year. Uh, it feels like that's where I do most of my reading on the repeat basis. Um, you know, outside of your devotional, you know, whatever. Yeah, th- that's kind of where I've been <coughs> sinking my teeth. And what I noticed is that mission and the sense of legacy is what has... Uh, kept me on track in the seasons of transition. If you look at jo- Joseph's life, um, the, the tests he faced were difficult. I mean, you, you go from the most beloved of your father's house to enslaved by your father's house to the highest in authority in your master's house to betrayed by your master's house to prison. And, and then, and then you, you hook up some dudes in prison. You're like, hey, I got you, homie. And remember me. And they don't. And like you're constantly forgotten, overlooked, mistreated. Da, da, da. Those were big deals. But those were peaks in the story because they're, they have so much tension. What you, know, what you don't realize is that what qualified him to pass those tests was how he transitioned. And so how you transition is really going to be determined by how you, uh, wh- where your true north is set to. And what your mission and what your calling on your life is. And if I go, hey, I know the calling on my life. When you're in transitions and you're disillusioned, not if but when, I, I've, I've learned that God has no interest in you encountering disillusionment. He is promising you will. He's committed to it. I want, he's going to knock out every prop, everything that we thought we could hope for in our calling. Hey, I feel so called by the Lord to ministry. The only thing that has to happen is all these people need to like me and give me a platform. He will absolutely kill that dream because it's nothing. It's a vapor. He wants you to be tethered in your calling to him and him alone, and that will keep you through the transitions. And that's a really important part because you can have your identity. And, and identity, uh, anyone heard the new Hillsong United album? First song. Oh, man, I'm loving it. I'm just repeating that joker. And it says, come as you are or as you want to be, right? It's a beautiful way. That's, that's, that's how David approached God. Like, Lord, I have been righteous in your sight. Uh, are we reading the same story? Like, you have not been. Quite often, in fact, David, you have not been righteous. But he came as he knew God destined him to be and came to him as he wanted to be seen by God. And so that's an act of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? So... I'm getting off track. I'm being too preachy. We're not even talking about stories anymore. But your sense of calling, mission, your identity, all these things, they will be tested. And how you transition is what's going to determine if you can push through and break through those, those, those elements of resistance that you're going to encounter. And your sense of mission is going to be a huge tool in helping you accomplish that and get through it. This, uh, the last piece is direction. Um, we live in a world that craves certainty. People want certainty more than they want anything. If I do A and B, C will happen. If I go to college, I'll get a job. If I find a spouse, I'll be happy. (laughs) You have not been married before. (laughs) Marriage will make you holy, but it might not make you happy. (laughs) Uh, No, I actually have a great marriage. I laugh about it. I joke about it because it's not an actual pain point for me. So we're okay. We're okay. Just letting the the peanut gallery know here. You don't need to come up to me and help my marriage after. (laughs) Unless you got some good advice. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. If I have money, I'll be satisfied. If I market the thing this way, it'll sell. And da, 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 da. You know, we've got all these certainties we want. A plus B equals C. Um, but not like certainty is an, is an illusion. There is no such thing as certainty. There's something far more valuable than certainty. It's clarity. Clarity is based on understanding. Certainty means I know A, B, and C will happen. And we live in a, we live in a culture that loves certainty. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I hearkened to it a moment ago of uh, the American dream. I'm going to put my time in. I'm going to have a great pension. I'm going to be able to save up. My kids are going to go to college. I'm going to have the boat. I'm going to da da. It's certainty. My plan. Da 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 da. And what I found is my plans are terrible, and they never work out the way I think they will. So the, the video this morning, the opener, um, 
it was kind of a proof of concept because we're going to be doing like a feature length project on Revival. And so we were like, hey, let's do a 10 minute short film and we'll open the conference with it. Awesome. And um, I'll just tell you how guaranteed you are for plans to not go well. Uh, we went to Detroit, to Bethesda, uh, well, where Bethesda was. They have all the original seats. We filmed there and, and all this stuff. And, and, and we're kind of in go mode. And we get back and we realize there's some problems with the footage. Uh, and the cost of fixing those problems for me personally was over 100 hours of we have to figure out how to make this work. How do I get rid of this? How do I do it? And it was a nightmare. And guess what? Every project I've ever had has had something like that. You never expect it. It's always going to But what helps me in those moments of guaranteed resistance is not certainty that the project's going to turn out the way I hoped. My, I've never done a project that turned out the way I thought it would. Never once. Maybe once. But it probably wasn't very good. <laughs> Never once can I recall something significant happening the way I thought it would, but what preserved me was clarity. I knew what I was trying to say. I knew why I was trying to say it. I had my sense of mission. I had the DNA. I knew what, you know, and and, and at the end of the day, I was willing to go, you know what? This may not be awesome. This may not work the way I hoped it would, but I know what I need to do. I know what the next step is. And you may not know where the next step leads, but you know how to take it. And clarity is something that this, and clarity is something that this, this world needs. We, we, you know, the church, for a long time, we've offered certainties, you know, and, and, and we've treated, you know, honestly, we've treated sinners <coughs> in the same way we do a contractual transaction. You know, if, you, if you'll say the prayer, you won't go to hell and you can be in the club. You know, like, it's kind of this, I know it's really harsh and not the heartbeat of most people who are passionate about evangelism by any means. But it's, it's, been, um, it's been filled with certainties if you do this and this and this. If I allow this in my kids' lives or I don't allow this in their lives, they'll turn out to be godly. If I do this, this will happen. If I go and ask for forgiveness, they'll give it to me. If they come to me and ask for forgiveness, it won't be complicated anymore. Like, we all want things to work out the way they're supposed to. And what I found in navigating all the uncertainties that are inevitable is I need to be craving and reaching for clarity. And that's something that the Lord does through, us, uh, through Scripture. That's something the Lord does prophetically, the Holy Spirit. But you can also build systems. You've got a system for everything you do. You have a system for everything you do. It's either by default or design. But you do everything you do like clockwork. I guarantee you, if aliens were observing us, they'd be like, these creatures do the same thing over and over again every day. All of us do it. We all think we're unique sunflowers. And we're just like, you know, I'm a unicorn. No one's like me. There's a lot of people like you. And you're a lot like yourself all the time, whether you know it or not. And so I figure, hey, what can I do to harness the fact that I know I'm a creature of habit and build things into my life that promote clarity and don't let me get stressed out about certainty? Because certainty, here today, gone tomorrow. You're never going to have it. But clarity not only will enrich your life, it'll make you a better storyteller when the things do happen, when the, the freak out moments happen, when you lose the footage. There's a phenomenal story about this at, uh, from Pixar. There's a really great book called Creativity, Inc. that I highly recommend. It's like, I go through it probably once a year. It's like the creative Bible, um, for me at least. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of part memoir, part uh, leadership, creative leadership book, part bi- you know, biography. You know, it, it, there's all sorts of elements to it. But he tells this, uh, Ed Catmull, who's the president and one of the founders of Pixar, tells a story how in Toy Story 2, they'd originally, they were gonna, it was in the era where all animated sequels were like straight to VHS and terrible quality. And it was like they were just going to do it. It was a money choice, right? That's it. We're just going to make money off this thing. And so they decided to do that with Toy Story 2. But then they were like, we can't do this. This will destroy our souls. We have to make it as good as anything. They still had like the eight-month deadline, though. And they had to make a film that would normally take them almost two years and eight months. And anyway, at some point into the process, um, somebody hits a very long – I can't imagine this was an accident. Maybe it was a saboteur. Maybe there wasn't. But on their servers, they start to, there's a very specific command that gets put in and it starts deleting everything. Everything. Like animators are working at their stations and things start disappearing on their screens. And they're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? By the time they get to the root of the problem, 97% of the movie is gone. And what they didn't do was go on a witch hunt. It was an an, an absolutely mind-blowing display of clarity and leadership. What they didn't do is try to find out who was responsible because they thought, well, either if they really were trying to do this, there's nothing, what are we going to do? I mean, we're gonna, they're gonna, their character will show through it any, anyway. They'll get fired eventually. And if someone didn't mean to do this, we will crush their soul if we come after them. So what, what can we do to preserve our culture and our, and our, and our DNA and, and yet also solve the problem? And it just so happens that one of the producers on the film 
was on maternity leave for much of the production, and she had a backup at her house. And so they go, they go to the house, they, so they end up recovering much of what they lost, but clarity is what inspired action and recovery in that moment. And it was a, a, a case study in people being masterful at their craft, knowing what they're doing, having all these things. But if they were to look for, like, who did this? We have to start over. If that, you know, that's a certainty response. It, they would not have been able to achieve it. And it went on to be the greatest animated sequel ever. And it grossed them a ton of money. Like, but clarity, without clarity, the story was impossible. We would have never been hearing about it today. And it's really cool. So next time your video guy deletes it all, you go nice, you be nice. You go, hey, get some clarity, pal. Make it work on time still. And then they will. They'll have to. Or they're not your guy. Okay, so at the beginning of this workshop, I um, said that nothing I'm telling you is going to take money or resources of any kind or relationships. And I want to try to prove it to you with one project that I think I spent $50 on. And I did in my, at my kitchen table. And it was for my dad here. And it's, uh, it's not the one he showed in there. But it's the reason I want to show it is because, hey, I think you'll like it. It's very good. I cry every time. Um, but it's personal for me, obviously. But it's a really great example of when you put these things, not into maturity and into full activation, but when you put them, just set them in motion, it is possible to make things that matter, that have impact, that reach people, that don't cost you anything that you're not willing to pay in time and discipline. And it's not going to be the great... If I wanted to impress you, I would show you a different video. This is not about impressing you. But the reason it's meaningful for me is because it is a case study in a lot of these things I'm talking about. And um, just a couple little tidbits of, of free info on it. So you, you'll see it's just going to be simple camera movements with handwritten notes. And that's how, for years growing up, because my dad's vocal injury, that's how he communicated with us. And so it really is this, while it's cheap and low budget and not going to blow you away in any sense from a production standpoint, there is such a rawness that is so connected to, like, I wrote what I knew. And, and it was real and it wasn't perfect. But I think what I'm hoping is it will inspire you to go, hey, I can do this. I've got a story and I can tell it and I don't have to have money. All I have to have is time and willingness.
was horrible because now they are paying me to figure this thing out, to work it out with God and to somehow come to some kind of resolution. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm a wreck. Our church had three services at the time and I would bring my family to the Saturday night service to get it over with so that I wouldn't have to go on Sunday. I remember this one weekend, we came to church Saturday, got up Sunday morning, got in my reading chair, got my Bible out, and I've got such a cloud of oppression over my mind, I can hardly breathe, and I'm desperate for a word from God, because back in that season, the only thing that would strengthen and help my soul would be a word from God, as Ephesians 1, 17 speaks about the Spirit. you this. 
is angry. I swear when you're in that kind of a tender place emotionally, you have a demon parked on your shoulder because I've got this megaphone in my ear that is just yelling at me. Abandoned, forsaken, it's over. Wake up and smell the coffee. God's finished with you. You're a has-been. I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff in my ear. Oh, <laughs> 